Yes. He legitimately for about two weeks time was like genuinely upset with me calling me a fake and a phony <laughs> for, for doing the commercial. And he was actually and probably still is to this day, not happy with me. Hey! With Michelle Jingris. I'm Michelle Jingris, and my guest this week is Nate Bordeaux of Utica City, co captain of that team. We're going to talk a little bit about this year for your team so far, what your growth has been like so far throughout just indoor soccer and beyond, some of the other things that you're doing on the side. Um, lots to actually dive into. I know you recently just got a new car. That's exciting as well. Yes. Um, but let's start with okay, so we were starting to record this a few days ago. And you were starting to tell me about this story uh, that involved LeBron James and a tweet. And I didn't know a lot. And I didn't have a ton of background. So I want you to share that story and how you ended up in, I believe it was a, was it a Kia commercial? Correct. Okay. So yes. how, how did that happen? So first off, thanks for having me. Um, I, I figured... Um, the first question would be something about LeBron James. It usually, it usually is with the, the whole Kia commercial. And um, that whole story is pretty simple. I was, I think I was in college at the time and me and a couple of roommates were watching, I think it was the Cavaliers versus the Thunder at the time. And LeBron James popped up in a, in a Kia commercial driving, you know, whatever model it was at the time. And uh, me being, uh, a non-believer that the greatest athlete in the world um, is no offense to Kia. I think they've done a great job, uh, especially recently, but I put out a tweet saying there's a thousand percent chance that there's a zero percent chance that LeBron James drives a Kia. Um, didn't think anything of it. I've put out a lot of dumb things before. And I think not even maybe Two years later, I get a message from a, a Kia representative out in Los Angeles saying they're running a, a promo uh, series for LeBron. And they came across my tweet and they loved it. And they were just curious if they could run it in an ad, in a commercial. And and then from there, I, I was naive. I said, sure, still not thinking it was real. And I think it still didn't release for over over a year's time from after I spoke to her and to the representative. And then one day I'm coaching and all of a sudden my phone just starts going crazy, like retweet, like re and, and then right then I'm like, Oh, it must be public somewhere. Wow. Um, so I had a bunch of texts from people I haven't spoken to in years coming out of the woodwork, just, uh, basically making fun of me because I don't know if you've seen the commercial, but LeBron, um, he basically tells me how my math is wrong. So, okay, that's kind of the story. So when they reached out to you, how did how did the rep even get in touch with you? Like, how did they know that that it was you and your account and all of that? Was so, it like a DM on Twitter or something? So it was a DM actually on Facebook. Um, my guess is she saw my Twitter handle was my name and yeah. looked, looked me up on Facebook and then searched me through through that way. You didn't feel like, was there ever a point where you were like, mm, is this like legit? Like this random um, Facebook message I'm getting? The, the entire time, I didn't think it would be <laughs> anything as, as legitimate as it was. I think it was part of a maybe four commercial segment that aired the entire NBA playoffs. So it was getting wow. some pretty, some pretty uh, regular coverage. And it was just interesting to see, you know, people who I haven't spoke to since high school would be reaching out. It was, it was funny. And did you get compensated for this at all? Or was this just like publicity for you? So that's, that's the number one question my friends asked. And no, I got, I got absolutely nothing from it. Just the commercial. I, right. Hindsight. I should have, Maybe try to get tickets or a jersey or, or something, but no, nothing. Maybe maybe next time you send out a viral tweet, that'll be what you aim for then, right? <laughs> Still a cool right. story, right. though, to share. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, um, and I think I think a lot of it, too, is I've never been a big LeBron fan, so people had fun with that, too, because I've kind of been a hater for a long time. So. Didn't you mention to me last week, too, that like one of your teammates either – 
either one of your current teammates now or one of your teammates in college was like a huge LeBron fan. Which so yeah, so yes, one of my uh, one of my teammates um, from early indoor days. Okay, um, is a diehard um, LeBron fan. He actually went to the same high school. So that's right. Yes, he legitimately for about two weeks time was like genuinely upset with me calling me a fake and a phony <laughs> for for doing the commercial and he was actually and probably still is to this day not happy with me for it so what do you think about lebron saying this year that when he becomes a free agent he wants to go and play basically wherever his son plays for a year and that he'll go anywhere and kind of kind of trying to like just get teams to draft his son so that then he will go there as well like what's your take on that see i've matured over the years so <laughs> i'm not i'm not going to say anything that that can put me on uh, on blast i'm trying to bait you for another yeah, commercial. You're, <laughs> you're baiting me um i think i learned my lesson and with maturity i think it's actually really cool that yeah he has that opportunity for sure um i'm still a michael jordan fan over the two but yeah that's yeah. the most you'll get from me yeah no i agree with you i actually think it's kind of cool that he's done so much in his career now that he's kind of at the point where like that might be like the final thing he wants to tick off the box, like, you know, to cap off just a remarkable career and to play with your son for a year, I'd imagine would be really cool. I don't know how I'd feel though, if I was his son though, cause it's like having, you already have your coach and then you have your dad as well. I don't know. It's, it's, it, it's a lot. I'm with, I'm with you. It depends on, you know, their dynamic too. It's his son being what 18 going into a professional team. Like, right. He, he, it, it's interesting. I wonder, you know, what kind of relationship they have in the locker room. Cause it's, I mean, sports is a different environment. So. Right. And you remember probably your rookie year as well. I mean, it's very different from when you've been in the league for years, you know, just from an experience standpoint and taking it all in and, and all of that anyway. So that's our take on LeBron James. Um, you're also a Dallas Cowboys fan. So before we even dive into anything about this season with Utica or beyond that, What's your take on the Cowboys this year? This year? Um, this past season, I must say. Pretty much the same as it's been my entire Every life. Every year, right? <laughs> so I'm not like most Cowboys fans in the fact that I'm, I'm not delusional. Um, I'm ready for them to lose at any point, which they typically <laughs> do. Um, I'm a realist. I'm, I've been a fan since I was around four or five years old. I have a lot of family in Texas. And okay. um, I guess I started out rooting for the Bills, but my dad is a diehard Miami Dolphins fan. Mm -hmm. So right away, he said, No, you have to, you know, you need to find a new team. It's not gonna, it's not yeah. gonna happen. It's not gonna happen. So the Cowboys were just naturally always on national television. Um, so for me, it was a, it was an easy transition. Um, okay. I kind of regret it now because they're terrible ever since I've been able to remember, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, they're, they're like a real conundrum. I feel like because they have every piece that you could want and they have an incredible quarterback and they play great in the regular season, but they are like just the heartbreakers when it comes to the postseason or when it comes to, a wild card game or something like that. Like every year, I feel like it's inevitably the exact same outcome. Even yes. when you have expectations, like seeing them on hard knocks, I was like, is this a jinx? Like, this is, this is too much, you know, like um, every year that you think like I, I, every year I start the year and I'm like, wow, they look great this year. Like, could this be the year that they go? Like they're clicking on defense. Like they've, they've addressed their offensive issues. Like, the quarterback looks great this year. Like this is it, and then you sound like a fan. Are you? Are you no, a fan? No, you know, they're a likable team, right? Like they're a team okay. that like they have a lot of good pieces in place. Like I like Mike McCarthy. Like I, I really do think that I like Dak Prescott a lot. But whatever it is, they just can't seem to get over that postseason hump where they're really like, like where teams are really afraid of them. You know? I'm with you. I'm with you. I think uh, I. I mean, again, we're, I'm not behind the scenes, so you don't know how Jerry Jones is as an owner in terms of he's great at building this brand and making them the most marketable team and making all this money. But who knows kind of what the culture is like, the environment's like, you know, sure. behind closed doors that makes 
so many pro franchises make or break is the culture that they have within the team. So I, I don't know, maybe they're too spoiled. I don't know. Maybe it's, it's too good yeah. of a situation. I'm going to stop you so that we don't end up, uh, so that we don't end up saying anything that we, <laughs> we shouldn't be saying. Cool, um, cool. Let's go back and talk a little bit about your team this year. Obviously there's been some challenges on the field, but you know, I was just listening off camera, like you guys still seem to be a really close knit group. So Tell me a little bit about this season, what the challenges have been for you guys and how you've been able to kind of maintain that motivation and that chemistry, despite not always seeing the results on the field. For sure. Um, this is, I'm, I've played indoor a long time now. I think this is my ninth or 10th year. Um, and fortunately I've been able to be a part of, you know, successful teams every, I think almost every single year I've been in the league. Um, so, I mean, anyone can look at the, the record and see, you know, maybe Utica isn't where it's been in the past. Um, but this has always been a team and an organization and anyone around the league knows and they hear how, how close we are and how much of a family environment we have. Um, so it's, it's frustrating that necessarily the results aren't um, matching what we've done in years past to date, but uh, the team is – as close as ever um we've had some and this isn't to make excuses every team has their challenges mm -hmm. but we've been hit with uh a lot of injuries a lot of um, visa issues a lot of you know players coming in and out it's been a very abnormal season for us um mm -hmm. but for me personally i've i've actually i won't say enjoyed it more than other years obviously because you're in it to win but it's almost like a different challenge. Can we turn it around? Can we, uh, you know, start to prove people wrong? Can you see the team actually, you know, get better from game to game when in years mm -hmm. past, we've almost been good from the beginning. So you mm -hmm. don't really see the the growth in, in players and in the team. And I think this year could be different. And I think the mentality stays the same. That's one thing I was actually going to ask you, like how, how has your role had to change a little bit or, or not even necessarily change, just evolve um when you're dealing with like what you just mentioned like like maybe not seeing the results right away that you're used to seeing and trying to kind of be a leader when you're dealing with all of these just other underlying circumstances that are kind of in the background whether it be injuries or a visa issue or, or whatever how, how have you kind of what role have you taken on this season knowing all of that yeah you know and, and it hasn't been it's been almost like roll with the punches because it's not mm -hmm. like going into the year we knew five players would be injured for the season and three or four players wouldn't have visas. So it's like one thing after another. And mm -hmm. I think um, with being in the league and with this team for so long, um, I've learned from a lot of great veterans how to handle things with maturity. And I'm more of a lead by example person. I try to at least um, rather than, you know, be vocal because um, at the end of the day, talk is cheap. And really, you can only say so much if your actions aren't, mm -hmm. you know, backing it up on the field or in the locker room or, you know, just trying to be the best teammate and helping the younger players or new players in, um, then words really only go so far. Um, so I, I've enjoyed it, to answer your question. And uh, I just try to handle it the best way I can. I know I could obviously do better um but each day you we try to grow as a team and i try to grow as a player so it, it's also special you know what you said too about how the group is still as close as ever because you're facing you know you're in the midst of maybe facing some adversity right now um although you know you did have a huge win what was it two weeks ago on the road against st louis like do you use stuff like that as motivation like okay this can be a turning point for us this could be you know, and, and as you mentioned, like measuring just game by game, how we're getting better. Like, was that a really great milestone for your team this season? For sure. And I didn't even think about it until after the fact and maybe a couple of days after our win versus St. Louis. Um, like I said, a core of us have been here a long time. So mm -hmm. we, we've experienced everything together, but there's such a, a new group of players and a new core that when we won, the celebration was... I mean, we were, we, it's our third win out of 12 games. So right. the veterans are happy, of course, you know, you always want to enjoy those moments, but if you looking back on it for 
half of the team that's their only their third win ever in the league. So they don't necessarily have that um, that feeling or that muscle memory of winning. So you want them to you should we should really enjoy every win as much as you can because it is tough in this league and this is their first experience. So for me as a veteran, I have to look at it like that too. I have to be and others as well. We have to be good examples because this is a culture we want to create for the organization going forward. Did you try to like, you said in the, you kind of realized it after the fact, but it's a great point that you bring up like to kind of like let them have that moment, especially some of the younger players. Um, do you feel like they got a chance to really just bask in that win and what it took to, to win a game like that? I think so. You know, it, it was yeah. a special win for anyone just because, um, we had a good lead. We started out doing well, and then we ended up losing the lead. And the way we won um, by uh -huh. scoring a goal to uh, a game winner to end it, it's a special moment for anyone, but especially for a, a new group, it's yeah, it, it's definitely going to be a game they remember um, probably their entire careers, right? They're going to look back, some of these guys, in 10 years and talk about their first season with Utica and how mm -hmm. difficult it was, but mm -hmm. that's kind of how you, how you grow as a team. And I, I can tell it's still a strong team because um, we, we still fight every single time. So you'll be home, I believe on Wednesday night for the first time in a while, right? So what are the emotions and the excitement going into that game? Yeah. Home games in general in Utica are, are awesome. They're, I think I played, six or seven seasons in Syracuse and played in almost in every arena in, in the league over the years. And there's nothing like a, like a home match in Utica. The fans are, it's almost a sellout every game. It's wow. Uh, fans are loud. There's a beer garden right what, next to the field. So they're rowdy. What do you think it is about this team? Like that fans just like relate to so much and that you get such an amazing turnout. Like why do they, why do they seem to love you guys so much? I think soccer in general um, in the Utica area is just was, is very popular and was very popular. And our first year when we um, moved to Utica, it was, I think, a lot of hype around it. Our owner, owners did an amazing job um, getting the fans in the stands. And then we were a, a very good team and we're winning games um, mm -hmm. regularly. So they just took to us right away. And it's, it's been incredible. I don't know what the reason is, but after <laughs> a win, after a loss, you'll get text messages. People are just so passionate. I can't put it into words with any other team in the league that I've seen. That's awesome to hear. And for you just being the captain or co-captain of that team, like you grew up, you grew up down the road or is, is Utica like your hometown? No, so I, I'm born and raised in Syracuse. Okay, so, so not far, right. Yeah. Not far at all. Um, and in, you obviously played, spent time in Syracuse as well. So what is that like for you? Is that like a full circle moment to, I know you set records in high school um, playing in Syracuse. And then I know you have your school as well that you, that is local for you. But to also be a professional athlete in Syracuse, like, or, or in Utica now, is that, what pride do you take in that? Yeah, I, I, I try never to take it for granted just because it's rare. I don't know how many athletes get to – and we have a lot of local guys that have um, the privilege to do it, but being able to have your grandparents and your aunt and uncle and your family and all your friends be able to to come support you when they were the ones that were, you know, at your youth games and your high school games, it's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's definitely something that – you know, you get used to it over time being year 10 for me, um, but something I never take for granted. And I mean, I was even fortunate enough to play outdoor with and win a championship with the mm -hmm. Rochester Rhinos, which is right down the right road. Down. So, right, exactly. So it's been it's been a blessing and um, I try not to take it for granted. So that was you won that championship in 2015, right? So were you playing indoor soccer before that and then did some USL as well outdoor and then came back to indoor. How did that work? Yes. Yeah, so, yes. Yeah, so um, indoor and outdoor used to um, go well together. So a lot of guys would play yeah. indoor for five, six months and then go to outdoor. So the transition 
um, was smooth. The way I got to Rochester was a former uh, teammate of mine. He was playing with the Rhinos and, you know, we were going back and forth about how um, he thought I should come in and I wanted to come in and, you know, and get a look. And from there, um, he set me up and it, it worked out perfect. Uh, it was perfect timing. It was, um, but yeah, to answer your question, I was, I played outdoor before that, but back and yeah, forth yeah. between, back and forth between indoor and outdoor. And then just till the last three or four years, um, it's been indoor. Yeah. Cause, cause I was going to ask you, obviously I know you were at Rutgers, you were captain of that team that year. You guys went to the sweet 16, mm -hmm. you beat your, were you at BC yeah. before that for a season? Right. Yeah. Yep. And you beat them. And I know this was like going back, we're going back to like 2012. So I was like, should I even ask him about this? Cause it was so long ago, but is that still something like one of the prouder uh, moments in your soccer career? It's definitely in the, in the top moments of my career, going to Boston college, my, my freshman year and having it not work out the way I thought. And then flash forward three years to, to Rutgers. We, um, they, I think Boston college was the number one seed on our side of the bracket. And we ended up, um, winning our first game and um, seeing Boston College in the next round. And that was another moment where a lot of uh, people who knew my situation w reached out to, you know, wish me luck, but also they knew how much it meant to me and for us to be able to go there and we actually beat them on penalty kicks. It was a pretty, pretty special moment. Insane. For sure. Yeah. Um, all right. So year 10 for you indoor. What, what's, your own per what are your own personal goals you know like what was the step you wanted to take this season and as you look beyond this season what are you hoping to continue to do as you continue to just either maintain your status in this league or, or just reinvent yourself as you as a veteran yeah um for me i've been in the league now for 10 years and you know it's 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 fun to see your perspective and your your mindset change uh, as you go through the league. I think my first couple of years, you just want to make sure you can stay. Uh, mm -hmm. You do something or you find a role that makes you stick. And then the next couple of years, you, you try to prove your worth and, and show how high your value can go. And I think I'm in between that point. We're still showing what I'm capable of and, you know, wanting to, mm -hmm. you know, really be a, a difference maker, I guess, for lack of a better word, but winning now for me is more than, more than anything. It's, I joke and say it's the last thing on my checklist, but winning an, an indoor championship is, would put icing on the cake for, for everything in my career. And I think, you know, little goals along the way help you mm -hmm. get there. Um, whether it's certain being a certain way with the team or being a great teammate or, mm -hmm. uh, how I want to perform, but the end goal is now it's only championship and nothing else matters really. All right. You're focused. I like it. It's a good goal to have. Nate, thanks so much for taking the time. It was awesome to get to chat with you. For sure. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome. This is MASL Midweek with Michelle Jingers. You can catch these episodes every Wednesday right here. We'll see you next time.